Welcome to our new study in the book of Revelation. Revelation speaks to our world today. Everyone knows our world is rapidly changing. Come and see how God already knew about it. You will discover it's easier to understand than you thought. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember you on you. The pace of life just gets so out of hand. I try my best, but it's just never good enough. I'm reminded of how much I need to know. You are for me, you're not against me. You are with me. I'm not alone through all the darkest times and brightest days. I know. Welcome. So glad you could join us today. We have a really fascinating and very challenging presentation on the seven trumpets starting today. And these next three presentations are going to be very intense because the trumpets, folks, are actually one of the most difficult passages in the book of Revelation to interpret. So I hope we can build a frame of reference and lay a foundation for you that helps you to be able to see and understand them and realize the significance and importance that the trumpets play in the prophetic story. So with that, I'd like to just take a moment and thank Sherry for this incredible picture. This is just one of those lovely photographs of the hillsides there in Death Valley. And look at the color and the minerals, uh, everything you could imagine, that turquoise color in there. I'm not sure if that's copper that's just oxidized, but isn't that just spectacular? Uh, look at the color in the earth, you know? Uh, when you read about the holy city and those 12 foundations of different colors, you can kind of get a flavor of all the different things here, uh, just way down a mile down below the surface of uh, most people's homes at the bottom of Death Valley. So thank you, Sherry, appreciate that. All right, let's jump into our conversation here. So the series is called Revelation Now, and God shares his thoughts with you about the past, the present, and the future. So we're in Revelation chapter 8, part 1, and we are going to have a discussion on the first and second trumpets. So let's begin with Revelation 8, verse 1. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Now, we're going to revisit this when we discuss the seventh trumpet. We'll, we'll flesh this out, dig it out just a little bit deeper. But I would also like you to understand that prophetic time, about a half an hour, a half of a 24th of a day, is about two weeks. So there is this time that is mentioned. We aren't ignoring it. We're going to come back to it. Notice verse 2. I saw the seven angels stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Now, when the trumpets blow in biblical history, they announce a number of things. Here in Exodus 19, they're announcing the presence of God. So it came about on the third day, when it was morning, that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. So there's the presence of God announced by a trumpet. Notice here. Uh, there is a judgment of God coming, uh, but notice here in Numbers 10, 8 and 9, the priestly sons of Aaron, moreover, shall blow the trumpets. This shall be for you a perpetual statute throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land against the adversary who attacks you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered before the Lord your God and be saved from your enemies. Now here you have to blow the trumpet to, to know that you're going to have victory over your adversaries. But notice that in the seven trumpets of Revelation, God has his messengers blow the trumpet for the victory of his church. And I, I think that's really a fascinating point. Now, notice that God's about to act here in Joshua 6, 4, and 5. It reads, And also seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns. 
before the ark. Then on the seventh day you shall march around the city, that's Jericho, seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. Now the trumpets blow here announcing a coming judgment of God, and in this case, Jericho, the walls collapsed. Isn't that interesting? So here, the trumpets blow because God is right on the verge of acting on behalf of his people. Now that's a theme that plays throughout the trumpets, and I hope we can continue that conversation and help you understand. So the trumpets are God's, are the answer of God to the breaking of the seals and a response to the prayers of all the saints. I want you to understand the relationship between the seals and the trumpets. We will say this several times. So the trumpets blow in response to the prayers of the saints we spoke about in the fifth seal, and God is going to act on behalf of their prayers as he acts on behalf of our prayers. So when you look at the trumpets, understand the correlation between the believers praying and the action of God, especially against their adversaries. So keep in mind, when the Jewish Christians, uh, or the early Christian church, when this letter of John came, the Jewish Christians understood the language John used in his letter. It was familiar language used for the judgments of God, defending them from the oppressors. They would certainly be able to help new Christian converts from the community that were joining their church understand the messages as God acts on behalf of his people. So let's pause here for just a moment. Can you understand the correlation of how God acts on behalf of the prayers of his church? Can you also connect that on behalf of how God responds and answer to your prayers? In other words, when we look at the trumpets, we're looking at a reciprocal relationship, a symbiotic relationship, if you would, between the early church and God. And, and the angel messengers, in concert with the Father, are acting on behalf of the prayers of the people in the church? That makes the seven trumpets really a profound moment in biblical history. But understand how important that is for you personally and in light of your own personal prayers of a God who answers them. Uh, Revelation 8, verse 3. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hands. So on earth people are praying, but notice how this angel makes, I'm sure you've all burned incense, or maybe you haven't, maybe you should try it sometime. But notice how this angel has added to enrich before God the aroma, the sweet aroma of the prayers of the believers. Now that's profound. That should cause you to take just a moment to take a deep breath and understand this relationship to the prayers of the early church where we're at in the first trumpet. But then can you connect that to your prayers in the present today? God acts on behalf of the prayers of his people in Revelation 8. Notice verse 5. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar, that's sacred fire, and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Hmm. Isn't that a graphic and spectacular moment in spiritual time? We can identify the time of the trumpets by the location in the temple. It says that the altar represents the time of intercession of God's people. In other words, the censer with the coals 
is the altar in the Old Testament symbol where Christ would be the intercessor, or in the Old Testament, the priest would be interceding on behalf of the prayers of the congregation. So here we can look and say Jesus is still interceding in the heavenly sanctuary on behalf of the prayers of the believers. Now, a side note here that I think is rather interesting. This parallels the ministry of Jesus to his church on earth where Jesus is walking among the, the candlesticks. You see, the message of the seven churches and the seven seals tells the prophetic story of the gospel. At the same time, the seven trumpets reveal God acting against the oppressors of his church and the believers for the prayers of the saints. Now, a saint is not a statue in the church. I just want to clarify that. The word saint simply translated means the prayers of the believers. So whenever you see the word saints, don't get this image in your mind of some frozen statue in time. You're a saint because you're a believer, okay? Just make it fun. Uh, so I'm, I guess I'm talking to saints. That's pretty cool. So the action of the censer filled with incense and fire cast to the earth happens during Christ's intersection. The trumpets would be the announcement of the coming action of God against the oppressors of his new church. Okay, I think I've said that several times now. Bear with me. Verse 6. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now we have consistently started the seven churches and the seven seals right after the cross and following the cross of Christ traveling in spiritual time all the way down to the return of Jesus. So we are going to be consistent, and we are going to start the seven trumpets in the same consistent manner as they begin during Jesus' intercession. Now that first trumpet blows, bringing a judgment on Israel for its participation in the crucifixion of the Son of God. Israel suffered the judgment on Jerusalem, their capital, in 70 AD with the temple's utter destruction as prophesied by Jesus himself. So let's, let's look at it carefully. The first trumpet sounded, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown down to the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass burned up. Now, a third means this is a specific or limited event or a specific region or area. The first trumpet falls on Israel for breaking their covenant with God and crucifying the Son of God and rejection of the gospel. Notice what Peter says in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, verse 17. For it is time for the judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So it would be logical to believe that this judgment would start first with the house of God. Notice Matthew 3, 7 and 10 in verse 7. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? In verse 10, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees, Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, John the Baptist here is referring to Jewish leaders as trees. So when it says a third of the trees, you now see John the Baptist is referring to those trees as the Jewish leaders. The prophet Isaiah reveals an understanding of grass. Notice Isaiah 40, verse 6. A voice says, call out. And then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, was the message Isaiah was to call out. So even Isaiah understood that grass is symbolic of flesh here. Notice Matthew 23, here's Jesus speaking. Jerusalem, Jerusalem who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are unwilling. Behold, Jesus prophesies, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you from now on, you will not see me 
until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But there's more. Notice verse chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left on another. So here Jesus is speaking now as the prophet, prophesying the coming judgment against the temple and against Jerusalem that would come in 70 A.D. So what did Jesus know? He knew what was coming. And he wanted his disciples to see this and know this because Jesus knew that one day we would be studying the book of Revelation. And here it is, right here, the prophecy of this coming judgment on Israel, on their temple, and on Jerusalem. And it came right on time. I'm not saying I'm glad about this. I don't think it's a kind of story you find joy in. To me, it's a great tragedy. It's a sad story. The second trumpet blows, and it's going to bring judgment on Rome for its participation in the crucifixion of the Son of God. You see, Rome would fall at the hands of the surrounding tribes. The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures which were in the sea had life, died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, pagan Rome is the recipient of the second trumpet. And here's why I say that. Because in the Old Testament, the prophets always referred to kingdoms as great mountains. And in this, when the trumpet blows, a kingdom, which is a great mountain burning with fire, is going to collapse into the sea. And a third of the sea would become blood. When we get to Revelation 17, you'll see that the word sea prophetically represents people. So this is a bloody event that is coming, in this case, on pagan Rome. So let's... Pursue this a little bit deeper. Jeremiah 51, 22. Who destroys the whole earth, declares the Lord. And I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags and I will make you a burnt out mountain. So here Jeremiah is prophesying against this nation and referring to him as a burnt out mountain. Again, the language of judgment against an empire against a nation. So I think we're being consistent here. So a third, or the thirds, we have a third of the sea uh, to blood, that's those who oppose God. The creatures in the sea destroyed, that's their economy is devastated. And the ships are the wealth and pride of the nation, a third of those are destroyed. Now what would remain would become a new empire. Three armies destroyed Rome. She went up in flames. They destroyed its economy. And justice was served. Now, if you want to do some interesting research, Genesiric the Vandal sacked Rome in 455 AD. And, and if you look at these tribes, these little nations around coming against the Roman Empire, it's quite remarkable that they had such tremendous success. But Alaric the Goth in 410 AD sacked Rome for three days and hauled off slaves, prisoners, gold, and took all of those things. Probably the most interesting was Attila the Hun. He had a nickname as the Scourge of God. And, and let me give you just a little bit insight into Attila the Hun. He had negotiated a truce that the Roman Empire was to give him, specifically Eastern Roman Empire, I think it was 600 pounds, and don't hold me to that, of gold a year. 
And you know what happens if you don't pay your bills to the Huns? <laughs> okay, let, let's just slow down here for just a moment. So Attila went in, the, and all I can tell you is, is that he just totally devastated Eastern Rome. Again, do your research, dig this out a little bit deeper, a little bit farther, but I think you're going to discover that I think he ended up demanding like 6,000 pounds of gold. Now, none of these fellows you would really want to be your neighbor. They didn't have a great reputation. Uh, these tribes lived in a violent society. But I find it interesting that these small states around Rome brought her completely to her knees as a judgment of God against them. Isn't that fascinating? Now just think about that for just a moment. How did God fulfill this judgment? He used the Romans to tear the temple down and, and attack the city of Jerusalem. Here, on this judgment, God steps back and allows the Vandals, the Goths, and the Huns to come against Rome and utterly bring her to her knees, a great burning mountain. The first and second trumpet, those are significant, significant events in history to cause you just to pause and say, God is able to accomplish and convey a message to those who are the oppressors of the church. And we can see that in these stories. So, the collapse of the pagan Roman Empire would eventually be replaced by a new Christian Roman Empire it would be named eventually the Holy Roman Empire. And we'll discuss more uh, in our presentations on the third and fourth trumpets. But I want you just to pause and think about what it is we have said here today. Let's just review briefly. What, what we have said thus far is this, that God is consistent in ministering to his church in his ministry to the seven churches as the high priest in a white robe. That in the intercession of Christ, and think about this, as our intercessor, here he is interceding on behalf of our prayers, and as opposition comes against his newly formed church, then Revelation 8 and those first two trumpets, we see what? we see that God is intimately involved not only in ministering to those seven churches in history and in time, not only the unfolding of the attacks against the gospel in the seals, and, and he's proclaiming the church victorious in both of those stories, but as opposition, Satan is the enemy of the church, as opposition begins to come against the newly formed church, what do we learn today? In the trumpets, we have a personal God who acts, my friends, on behalf of the prayers of his church. Can I make that just a bit more personal? He also acts on behalf of your personal prayers. Because as we understand the book of Revelation right now, we understand that Christ is still in the intercessory ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. And what is Jesus doing there for you personally? Just ponder that. Let that settle in. The messages to the seven churches, promises of victory, call to repentance over 
and over and over. The seven seals, as darkness comes against the church, it cannot be stopped. The church will prevail. God never forgets his people or his church. The seven seals remind us that he will vindicate the blood of the saints that offer their lives in behalf of the gospel. And here in Revelation 8, what are we learning today? For you personally, what is the story? God still acts on behalf of the prayers, yours and mine, and the prayers of his people, and the prayers of his church. And here it's a prophetic story, a story in which he wants us to embrace, take hold of, have faith in, and confidence that come what may, you know you have an ever-present Savior. I would like to think that in the overview of the book of Revelation, that in everything we have studied thus far, and everything that is going to unfold, that there is a significant and profound truth there for you. And that is Jesus is the ever-present Savior in the midst of his people, in the midst of his church, right there for you personally. He is a personal God. Isn't that amazing? A personal God. And here you discover that as the trumpets blow, consequences happen, judgments fall. I want to take you to our last picture. Uh, this is just one of those moments that, uh, you know, you're just standing there and Sherry just happens to pull the trigger on that camera and she captures this one moment here of that butterfly probably getting some fresh nectar there. Isn't it amazing how God's creation takes care of each other here in this story? Beauty and splendor. I hope you come back next week and join us because when we do these next two trumpets, there is a great connection in these first four trumpets and those first four horses in the seals as they're broken. I hope you're blessed. Invite your friends. Don't forget to take notes. And we look forward to coming back and joining you this time next week. Enjoy. Be blessed. Take care now. Thank you for watching today. Our email address is ScreamingRockMinistries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho 83303.